I think that's uh, that's a signal that we can start, right, Brad? So that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm Brad Power. I'll just do a quick couple housekeeping things before we get started. Um, first is that um, this is uh, not medical advice. This is for information purposes only, and um, uh, you should take the information you get from a discussion like this to your medical team. And the second is that uh, everything that we say today will be made public. Um, so. Uh, if you're concerned about that, uh, feel free to turn off your video, uh, change your name, and don't say anything. But everything will will be uh, made public that we stay here today. And the, the final housekeeping thing is that we are a patient-led community, and we would appreciate any donations that you might consider making. We're a nonprofit. Um, and then last, uh, the connection to uh, Dennis and Madeline. Um, I was at a what was it called? It was an orphan drug. Yeah, conference. World Orphan Drug Congress. Yeah, World Orphan Drug Conference in Boston, and um, uh, and met them. I I had had interaction interactions with my tomorrows years ago under different leadership when uh, it was more more of a patient navigation service, and now it's much more of a focus on clinical trials. Um, and just chatted up uh, Dennis and Madeline there and invited them to present. And so um, they're gonna talk about the work that they do and the services that they provide for navigation and their experience. Okay, now turn it over to you, Dennis and Madeline. Thank you, Brad. And um, thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of uh, how we operate within the, this space. And I appreciate everybody's time today. So um, how we constructed this today is to Organize kind of like a fireside chat, talking around uh, patient navigators. Um, you know how we guide them uh, uh, or guide the patients through their clinical trial journey. So we have a couple slides. I think, as Brad already mentioned, if you have a question, please raise them so I can see them in the chat. Uh, could make that a very interactive session, which I think uh, historically is how uh, this webinar has always been. So um, just as a matter of introduction, um, you see me here on the left, but I'm Dennis Akaya. I'm the chief commercial officer. I've been with the company for nine years, uh, very active in the pre-approval access space um, um, and, and working with in various capacities within the bio, biopharma industry. Um, Madeline, maybe just a couple words on yourself. Yeah. Hi, I'm Madeline Carrier. I'm a pharmacist by training, and I work as a patient navigator here at My Tomorrows, performing the pre-screening assessments for our patients that are either wanting to explore or access clinical trials. Yeah, thanks, Madeline. Um, so maybe just as a kind of introduction of how... Uh, our company helps or operates within the space. Um, and also when Brad and I were talking about, um, you know, what we've achieved over the years. And um, um, it's important for you to know is that um, you probably get bombarded with a lot of um, uh, solutions or service providers with a lot of stats, but this is how we view the world is that we try to help um, a lot of patients uh, in, in their journey. Uh, this number that you see here is that we have um, engaged with 11,000 patients and provided a very high touch service from the moment that they're interested in a clinical trial all the way to actual enrollment. Um, usually patients are also in touch with their treating physicians. Uh, these physicians also start to understand how we can help their patients in their clinical trial journey. Uh, usually if they're satisfied, they tend to come with uh, more patients and situations to understand their clinical trials. Uh, and we operate globally um, um, from, from our offices in, um, in the US as well as Europe. Um, and so we're very familiar also with uh, cross-border referrals, which we won't discuss uh, today, but uh, it does happen. As you can imagine, there are many patients that are somewhat less fortunate to have access to clinical trials that sit outside of the Western Hemisphere. Um, and we also collaborate with um, uh, many biopharma companies that are actually trying to, um, you know, recruit obviously more patients for their clinical trials. So in essence, what we really try to do is help patients uh, discover and access their treatments. Um, I don't want to do too much promotion, but I, I thought it just might be helpful for you to give you um, a lay of the land of like how we operate and some numbers that, have, uh, that we attach to uh, and explaining our company. So um, when, when Brad um, um, came to us, like, okay, you know, we have this um, uh, patient-led community. Um, we've spoken about, um, uh, you know, 
uh, patient navigators or clinical trial navigation, very high level. How it works on our side is that what we uh, preferably want is for patients to be able to schedule a call with one of our patient navigators. Madeline uh, is one of those patient navigators that is based in the, here in the U.S., um, and the idea is that, you know, if they schedule a call that our intent is to provide patients an overview of clinical trials that is based on their unique medical um, profile. So um, we'll explain a little bit later also how that works, but that's kind of like usually as a second step. And what we all, always want to do is, you know, foster kind of a shared decision-making process between the patient and the physician, right? We want them to go back to their treating physician and say, um, it seems that this service has provided me, let's say, with a more curated list than what I can find on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, um, you know, uh, we want them to be able to make a, a have a discussion with their treating physician, so that then they can kind of um, um, uh, potentially pursue one of those trials that are on there. And uh, that is something that we would like to be involved in the sense that if they have selected one of those trials or if they have additional questions about those trials that they could receive an adequate request, whether that's the patient or the physician themselves. And then we can actually be part of the journey that goes beyond all the way towards potential enrollment. But again, we'll have some examples. And um, uh, as this is a fireside chat, I'll also be asking Madeline some questions that might help clarify how that process somewhat works. So uh, patient navigators are really critical, uh, we think, in this uh, whole ability for us to speak with patients and, and serve them in their journey. Um, I think it's important for you to understand is that whenever patients reach out to us, they have one dedicated point of contact from the moment that they reach out to us. Uh, in this case, it could be Madeline, but it, we, you know, we have also uh, other wonderful uh, patient navigators. And you know, the intake call and, um, you know, you, you know, usually what we try to understand is, you know, when were you diagnosed? What are your current treatments? Uh, but also like very simple questions, obviously, like how, how willing and able are you to travel? Because uh, as you might know, and I think this is a, a relatively well-educated uh, uh, group of uh, individuals that know something about clinical trials, but obviously travel distance also impacts the ability for us maybe to present certain trials or for your uh, success in, in terms of um, uh, getting into one of those trials. Uh, we know that many patients obviously uh, don't always only speak English. So currently we have ranging between 10 to 12 languages on staff, obviously, you know, Spanish, uh, uh, but, you know, for, for our European patients, there are many other languages that we have on staff and that usually really helps. Um, these patient navigators all are medically trained and have a medical background, uh, can be pharmacists, uh, nurses, uh, med some medical doctors, a pharmacist. Um, it is obviously super important for us that we, uh, provide that level of training, but also that they have that background to fulfill this role. Um, and what I think is also very important is that, you know, uh, one of the key things that they really do is really try to explain the concept of clinical trials. Uh, there might be uh, a lot of um, uh, myths uh, or perceived uh, barriers to clinical trial participation. Uh, patient navigators can function as a first um, uh, barrier, or at least let's say uh, um, a first point of contact to talk about these things. And what we've learned over the years that, you know, the ability to explain what eligibility criteria entail and, you know, specifically for trials, that is very much appreciated. Also why patients aren't eligible for a trial, because they might know something um, and then they have certain questions. So those kind of questions are really uh, important uh, early in the journey. And I think also kind of like the, the way that they're, you know, obviously they're very kind and very knowledgeable. Uh, but that really helps in the conversation because, you know, it is definitely a moment of, of building trust and the first person that they speak outside of their current care journey. Um, so it's important that these people know how to answer these questions in the right way. Um, and that is because we want to handhold them, right? There's a whole process from beginning to end in terms of understanding and screening them to be able to refer them to um, to a potential trial. And there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen Uh whether well, it's communication or other factors between the medical care team as well as the site to be able to make that successful transition. And uh, our patient navigators have kind of built those kind of workflows. Um, and Madeline will explain that later too. But I think that's important for you to understand of like how these patient navigators operate in this in this space. But I'm just checking there are no questions in the chat right thus far. Okay, I'll just proceed. Or there are. Let me see. 
Uh, it's a side conversation about uh, uh, okay. bone, bone, bone and osteoporosis. I think there's a question about 500,000 trials from Alan, which I'll just briefly touch. Yes, you're right. So that is a, um, a difficult way of navigating uh, all the trials also within certain diseases, right? You can have hundreds of listings. So uh, the added value of us is that if we provide an overview, they're obviously much more narrow and curated to the profile of the patient. And also we try to exclude, um, you know, not a lot of non-interventional studies or, you know, for some disease, there are gaming studies or uh, studies that are not actively recruiting. We think that uh, is information that uh, uh, on some occasions might not be useful for the patient to, um, to present to them. So I hope that narrows uh, down. I think at the top of med, we narrow it down to, uh, I think, less than 100,000 in terms of actively recruiting trials that we think are, are presentable um, uh, to, to the patients. Um, and maybe a quick follow-up question I see from Alan. No, we also pull from UDRA, and we also have uh, the ability to uh, add other registries, either from sites or from other WHO registries. Uh, but uh, currently what was public is only the clinical trials in UDRA, and we've kind of annotated and um, um, recreated kind of a search, uh, our search engine to provide what we think are the most relevant trials for each disease. Thanks for those questions, so very helpful. So maybe just to kick off with kind of like a, a small case example uh, as a patient story. Um, so um, in this case, it is uh, for a patient that actually knew about a specific trial within um, a diffuse midline glioma uh, with a certain mutation. And what we provided was one-to-one -one support for that patient to really understand how to actually get enrolled. Um, so um, in this case, uh, the patient was sort of lucky that he knew one specific trial. Um, I'm, I wasn't really sure how they became aware of that trial, but they did reach out to us to understand, okay, what do I do next? Um, and that's where we can provide, you know, um, uh, some value add to the patient, right? So what we did is we provided a lot of information about the trial specifically. Uh, we verified all the medical documents and information that they were able to share with us. And we, what we did is basically pre-screen the patient on the basis of the information that was known to us about the trial. Um, um, and if that's elaborate enough, then, then we can do that because uh, we really want to only involve, let's say, uh, other, other um, players within the re referral and enrollment process when necessary. So uh, we kind of did the pre-screening upfront with the patient, with all the information we had. But we also were able to address a lot of concerns uh, about the study design and placebo actually after we were able to make the connection with the site. And I think that's really important to understand is that usually um, I started off with one of the previous slides that it's the first point of de um, um, uh, dedicated point of contact. But usually that also stays the case once the patient actually is already on their journey towards the site. They, they trust Madeline, so to speak. Uh, they have maybe follow-up questions. So it's very natural for some patients actually to go back to Madeline and ask, well, I still have a question, like I'm in this flow at the hospital, but can you help me with this, this, and this? And I think that's kind of like shows you that there's still uh, room for improvement into making this kind of a little bit more of a pa um, patient-friendly exercise also upon referral and kind of all the activities that happen on the side. So those additional concerns uh, were addressed, uh, which I think was great. And we really were involved in kind of uh, facilitating the patient-to-site referral. Um, um, and, you know, again, I think the trust and the, um, not only from the patient, but also from the um, site and the staff that are there, uh, really, um, you know, show how, you know, qualitative, let's say, the connection um, um, is um, and that that kind of personalized support and also with all the kind of platforms and, and systems that we have behind it really helps make that a very accurate match. And yeah, I think, you know, in general, it's very difficult for uh, patients to be aware of about all their options, but I think just the kind of level of knowledge uh, that we provide on uh, if they have a specific question on trial, but also just in general about trials. And, and if they're like other trials that are recruiting, I think is extremely helpful. Um, and, you know, that's something that they are, um, you know, very happy with and that they can also discuss with their with their patient. Um, I'll quickly jump again to the, to the chat because I see some things uh, popping up, uh, if that's okay. 
Um, every patient needs an eligible patient advocate who pays for this service. Does insurance cover? Um, so, in, in 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 principle, you know, uh, the companies that work with us uh, kind of subsidize all the patients that um, reach out to us. So the patients never pay, in, including treating physicians. Uh, I'm aware that um, certain parts of patient navigation are increasingly being uh, covered. Um, and don't give me the exact details, but we're definitely looking into that to to see what can be covered, and that every indeed every patient has access to a patient navigator. Um, yeah, we've seen this um, multiple times, and as you can tell from the numbers that we presented, that. Uh, it, it sounds very simple just to put a patient navigator alongside with the patient, um, but it is that useful. It is that valuable for the patient. And uh, I would only, you know, only just agree that, you know, uh, um, every pay, patient, a patient needs a, a patient navigator. It, it really helps them in their journey, um, even though it's maybe just like a, a person just to, uh, to listen to the story of the patient, to see what the uh, friction and drop off points are in their journey. Um, you know, maybe to say the same thing that the, that the physician said, but um, I think there's just uh, the, there's endless uh, opportunities where a patient navigator can add value. But I also don't want to steal too much um, of uh, Madeline's story, which also has some uh, interesting things to share. So I hope, Erica, that uh, answered um, uh, your question. I assume silence is a yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, um, with that kind of introduction, um, um, you know, we, we, I, I want to obviously ask a couple of questions to Madeline. Uh, hopefully, this gave a little bit of a, a kind of introduction to how we operate in the space and how, how we think patient navigators are extremely important. So, um, you know, as this is a fireside chat, I'm going to look to you. I'm looking already at the screen, Madeline, but um, maybe you could explain to the audience, you know. Uh, what a, what does a patient navigator view do in your eyes? And um, although I gave already some examples, you know, how do I assist cancer patients throughout their treat, uh, treatment journey? Yeah, so I think you gave a wonderful overview of our process. I'll dive, dive deeper a little bit into some more detail. So basically, the goal of the patient navigator is to reduce the complexity surrounding clinical trials, guiding patients seamlessly from their initial intake call through to enrollment. So we're here to help those patients understand their treatment options beyond standard of care and address those concerns about participating in clinical trials. Maybe there's no treatment option available um, for a particular diagnosis, or perhaps the patient has already exhausted all conventional options. So as Dennis mentioned, we have medical backgrounds. We're all very well equipped to explain any information surrounding what a clinical trial is and the commitment to participate in one just so that patients feel um, that they are able to make a well-informed decision. Um, but as we mentioned in the beginning of this chat, it is important to note that we can't offer any medical advice, but we can um, certainly explain any information pertaining to a study. So our process, um, as Dennis had mentioned, starts with an intake call during which we gather information about medical history. This could include past treatments, their current condition, um, that data collected. Um, is stored compliantly in our unique interface tool created specifically for our patient navigators. So following this call, patients are invited to the patient platform, which is their own distinct environment. And this is for them to upload any relevant medical documents such as genetic reports or laboratory results. Um, within this platform, patients can also access their treatment search report. This is a comprehensive document detailing clinical trials, which they may be potentially eligible for, and based on their ability to travel express during that intake call, because we do want to take in all factors um, for referring patients. So should, patients, should a patient express interest in a particular study from that treatment search report, they simply inform their patient navigator. And then from there, the navigator will take proactive steps, reaching out to relevant sites um, via the platform on behalf of the patient to initiate this communication um, and start that referral process. So this systematic approach really ensures a seamless transition from exploration um, to potential engagement with clinical trial sites. So I'll open it up to any questions if there are any. Yeah, I think there was a question which uh, Brad answered. Um, 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 so we need to funds this, right? So we try to be available for any patient, for any disease in any country. Um, and the companies that um, work with us, where we, um, we where we make referrals and actually, you know, get get paid um, uh, by, they actually fund the ability for us to to serve uh, patients that, um, uh, yeah, if they would come in with a with a company or disease where we're not very active in. 
Um, so I see that the follow-up question from Alan is what biofarm kinds are top referrals? Um, you know, they're very area disease areas where we are um, more active in than, than others. Um, uh, um, so it depends. Um, what we prefer is to be active with multiple companies within one particular disease. Uh, as you can imagine that, you know, there might be screen outs from uh, some of uh, from some of some one trial or one company, uh, or there might be a physician that we have engaged with that has multiple, uh, you know, kind of patients in the future. So, you know, we are not, we're, we aren't disease specialists, but we do like to have some kind of more mass or clout within one disease so that we can leverage some of our investments to attract these patients to, uh, to find us. Um, um, so that, um, yeah, we can obviously subsidize more patients reaching out to us and, and also find uh, what trials work for them. Uh, I would say that also a lot of companies appreciate that we always help patients on their journey if they're a screen out for their own trial, right? So the patient's not then notified, well, you don't qualify for this trial, then good luck, right? So there are various ways where we are able to do this on a larger scale. Um, so Ryan has a question if you, if it wouldn't create a conflict, if you're funded by biopharma companies. Um, so um, the way it works, it's a good question. Um, the way it works is like if we, if we if we operate on their behalf, um, obviously we're, our goal is to see if patients are eligible for 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 their trial, and it's it's kind of done through a different uh, journey. But in principle, and most um, um, when patients reach out to us, we're only agnostic and informing them about all their options, right? And they they may select one of our clients, and we can't promote. Uh, uh, a client's clinical trial in particular. Uh, the, basically, the report is constructed as such that the ones that are most advanced are on top, and there's no way to see which companies are working with us and which ones are not, right? So any kind of agnostic uh, overview has no way of detecting that which ones are being paid by us. So I hope that has a question. In the initial conversations, do you find yourself... Uh recommending any uh any testing uh that might qualify someone for particular trials for example if they haven't done genetic testing yeah so during calls um at first intake i just trying to assess what information they already know um if again they express from a treatment search report or if they already know of a particular study um and that that is a piece of information that we don't yet have but is a part of inclusion exclusion criteria um a lot of times the sites will offer free genetic testing um, if they are potentially eligible. So that's a conversation I can have with them or if they already have a really good relationship with their treating physician um, and they're not worried about um, finances, they often go by themselves and get that genetic testing done um, to see if they are eligible. But a lot of times sites, um, again, it's not a blanket statement, but a lot of times sites will um, pay for this to be done if they already are deemed potentially eligible based off of the information I've already gathered. Yeah, and I would also add to that, uh, David, is that, um, you know, uh, for some programs and diseases, there are genetic testing are obviously available. And we, what we only can do is kind of also orchestrate or direct them to where they can get that additional genetic testing so that we can then, as a follow-up call, if once we receive that testing, obviously make a much more narrow search, right? Again, if you only search on a disease with a couple of criteria, the overview might be somewhat less relevant than when you have the exact genetic mutation so that we can then take a look, right? So that, uh, again, the follow-up steps can be more efficient. How common do you find it is that patients don't know uh, what they should be testing for? Um, I would say it's very rare in this sense. Um, patients really have become um, advocates for themselves, which I encourage. They do come with a lot of information, a lot of questions. Um, so our chats are usually very productive. Um, so I would say it is rare that they are unaware of, you know, what is needed to move forward or or just about their diagnosis in general. Is the profile of your typical customer um, someone who's at a community hospital um, and is sort of plumbing into the more specialized areas? Because I'm thinking like in my case, I'm being treated at Dana-Farber. Many of the patients here would be at an academic research medical center. And they're very knowledgeable about what is the, what are the clinical trials out there. I just had that conversation literally this morning with my oncologist. And so I really wouldn't, I would need this service because I'm already getting that service from my oncologist. But 
it, you know, with 80% of people, I think, get treated in a community hospital. So they would not have that same menu of options. No, I agree with you completely. Um, those that are at academic institutions or focused institutions do have advantages of knowing information first. Um, sometimes, though, their direct physician isn't aware of how to actually get them enrolled in a trial. So sometimes they do loop into us regardless of knowing the trial. So that is a case where they are aware of their options. They want to know how to then get enrolled. Um, but then on the flip side, as you mentioned, there are, I mean, the nation's um, quite vast and there are areas where, the, you know, um, there's concerns about health literacy and not knowing your options. So we do have a large population of those individuals as well that reach out and are just um, either newly diagnosed or have run out of options. And they're just like, I don't know what to do. Um, this is what I have. This is the information and the reports that I've come with, you know, what now? So we do see both sides of it. Yeah, thanks, Madeline. And um, thanks, Brad, for that comment. I see um, Robert also coming up with a comment. Um, yeah, there might be a bias to the trials at this institution. I think that even at some large institutions, I've learned that they're not even aware of, let's say it's cancer with a certain mutation, right? And there are two different departments, one on brain, one on lung. Uh, and they, they wouldn't even, they sometimes they also have difficulty understanding what trials are running at other departments within their institution. Um, so uh, I think it's always helpful just to get, um, uh, you know, you probably have access if you're in at, at an institution like that to the best trials. It never hurts maybe just to get another overview of all the other trials. Maybe there's something else. Um, don't know if the institution um, <laughs> always would would uh, maybe agree. And I, we, don't, we definitely don't want to uh, interfere, but uh, at least having that information in a, a concise report uh, might be helpful for any discussion that uh, occurs in their journey. Um, I think there's a question from Kuldeep. Do you report on patient outcomes for the different clinical trials that you recommend, or do patients have to wait till pharma companies publish results? Um, yeah, uh, we, do, we don't report on the outcomes of the trials. Um, um, yeah, we have to basically have to wait to pharma company publishes the result. Uh, what I can say is that for um, the companies that we work with, they are learning from the patient experience and uh, uh, you can see that they are thinking ahead how to be more patient centric, which uh, I would not exclude the ability for them to easier find a way to uh, publish the results or even say thank you to participants. Yeah. All right, Madeline, thank you very much for that. Let's dive into the next uh, next one. Um, uh, we already talked about some of the barriers that you encounter, uh, but maybe you can uh, chime in a little bit more about that and also what you do to to overcome these uh, barriers that you, you see regularly. Yeah, Brad set the stage for this next one. So yeah. <laughs> for most, one of our most common barriers um, we see patients facing is simply, as I mentioned, not being aware of their options beyond standard care. You know, they often develop these strong relationships with their physicians, agreeing on treatment plans and exploring those secondary options. However, once all avenues have been exhausted, there's often a lingering question of, well, what now? Um, and physicians understandably are stretched thin and can't always keep up to date on the latest research in the field, even at their own institutions. Um, so currently, clinical trials are not seen as um, standard considerations when developing treatment plans, um, but they should be incorporated as these two are options. Um, so that's where we step in. We bridge that gap by providing patients with the information they need to make these well-informed decisions. Um, and then on the other hand, I also had mentioned for those patients who are aware of a specific trial they'd like to participate in, um, as demonstrated in our patient case, they came to us, um, a different barrier emerges, uncertainty of who to come whom to contact and the information required. So many patients find themselves in the dark about these next steps and lack that designated point of contact for their questions. So even when they manage to reach out to a site, they often incur or encounter challenges such as low response rate or no response rate at all. Um, some sites just aren't well equipped to receive this number of requests as efficiently and compliantly as they should. So such situations leave patients feeling confused they often have unanswered questions of, did I reach out to the right individual? Were my documents received? Am I ineligible? And if so, for what reason? Um, so while we understand that sites are often overwhelmed, 
we recognize the importance of providing our patients with this clarity and support. So to address these issues, our patient navigators conduct that thorough pre-screen assessment during the intake call. And this ensures that a patient is only presented with those options that they are potentially eligible for, as Dennis had mentioned in the beginning. We want to avoid you know, instilling false hope for those individuals. So we really hone in on those results that they are potentially eligible for. So while some criteria may require you know, further evaluation during on-site screening, as we can't um, collect all the information via the phone um, during that initial assessment, it significantly streamlines that process. So from us, patients also receive that, re that real-time feedback as to why they may not be eligible for a particular study or their status once they're connected to a site. These are all super valuable insights for patients to know as it helps them again, make those decisions within that process. And then ultimately, all the way through that journey, um, sites enjoy receiving referrals from My Tomorrows because our efforts in performing these high-level pre-screen assessments, it drastically reduces um, burden on the site. Um, and then it expedites the patient experience. So we're trying to make it as easy for all stakeholders involved. Um, sites have their own unique environment built into our platform to receive those patient referrals in an organized and compliant way. And this just eases the referral process for everybody involved. So just to summarize, the patient navigator has their own interface, the patient themselves to upload medical documents, and then the site to receive the referral, again, all compliant and stored in a precise manner so that all the information is easy to read and they're not sifting through medical files. We've honed in on that um, summary of information that's needed. Yeah, thanks, Madeline. And I think also um, just to um, continue a little bit on that, I think it's important that, you know, what we want to uh, indeed avoid is sending a kind of an unqualified uh, patient that is not uh, pre-screened well enough so that the first uh, on-site screening, uh, when that occurs, that they they fail, right? And that's when I think what we've learned over the years that sites are hesitant to work with somewhat more novel business models such as ours, uh, because they get, you know, you can always advertise or find patients interested in, 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 a, in a trial, but how do you know that's the exact patient? And how do we make sure that we align in terms of resource uses that uh, if they get a referral that it, you know, there's a very high chance that they can get actually screened and enrolled into the study. So that's something that we're um, definitely trying to do. And I think, Maybe if I look at the chat, which I'm, it might be a nice segue to 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 a slightly different topic, but you know, Cheryl had a question about: Is there a way to get into a trial at a distant location but utilizing a closer location? Right. So um, that is something that we we uh, we encounter a lot. I think um, you know if this is uh, run by a certain institution, um, um, uh, you know, pre preferably we're also involved with the sponsor side or the 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 the, the pharmaceutical company side. Uh, it is always important to present uh, the case and also the request. Um, you never know, right? If it's a different institution that they're able to uh, to participate uh, in, in in direct or indirect way. But we think it is important just to make these requests. And uh, if it's not possible from a location perspective, that at least the the kind of the ecosystem is aware that there is somebody that is uh, eligible for this trial, but that travel distance wasn't uh, was an issue. Uh, so that hopefully one of the stakeholders can uh, go above and beyond and make a, make a um, uh, create a solution that would would might work, which uh, in in this case would involve maybe um, um, the the patient to be um, um, uh, enrolled um, somewhere nearby. And I'm just going to Clifford also had a question: If a patient has a poor standard of care treatment options and clinical trial options, what do you tell them about expected benefit of joining a trial? versus standard of care. Now, Madeline, do you have some comments on that? Yeah, so again, clinical trials are mostly used um, when they have exhausted all standard of care treatment. So I don't often see patients who haven't tried standard of care and are just jumping to clinical trials. Um, to explain the expected benefit, um, you know, it's just another option. It also, there's very, there's many variables um, to this. It depends on the phase of the study that they are interested in, a phase three versus a phase one. So obviously phase three, I can explain a little bit more about past data um, that has already been established from those previous clinical trials. Um, but as to benefit, that's very case specific and trial specific. Um, so all of those conversations are very tailored to that patient. Um, so I can't really give a, a full answer, but more of a blanket statement, if that's all right. Uh, somebody raise their hand. Robert, you had a question? Sorry. 
Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, actually, I find it a little disconcerting, Madeline, when you said that uh, <clears throat> patients usually look at clinical trials after they've failed all standard of care, right? Mm -hmm. I would argue, and I argued all, all referrals I have, that uh, clinical trials should be considered upfront and throughout the whole process, and that at any given point in time, Patients need to be making informed decisions around all their options that are available. And if they just limit it initially to standard of care, they're perhaps uh, limiting their possibilities. So I guess uh, I'm curious into how you, how you, if that's the mindset you also have, and if so, how do you sort of encourage patients to be thinking more broadly from the get-go? Yeah, no, so that's a great um point. Um, as I said, as of right now, I do see that that is the landscape that we're in, that people do only approach us when all, ex all options have been exhausted. Um, but we are seeing, again, from attending conferences and establishing um, partnerships with patient advocacy groups, we're seeing the landscape change. So that's where this is a really important time. And that's why we enjoy doing webinars and educating um, people on the fact that um, aside from your physician, there are resources such as ours that you can see your other options. So it is our voice um, trying to educate the public and physicians. That's why it's so important that we have these relationships um, with outsiders and other stakeholders, stakeholders other than um, patient advocacy groups and physicians, because we are trying to change that landscape so that patients understand this isn't a last resort. Um, it should be an option that's explored during standards of care. Dennis, I'm not sure if you wanna add. Yeah, I, I think Robert, excellent point. Um, 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 you know, we've also put effort in the past to share patient stories, and I, th I think uh, the quote was uh, something: uh, consider clinical trials not as your last option, but as your first option. Um, um, so, yeah, I, I, I would, um, um, uh, you know, uh, definitely what Madeline said uh, is absolutely true. I would also add to that that. Uh, uh, we're trying wherever we can uh, to compliantly and to uh, uh, mindfully uh, elevate the discussion about clinical trials. Uh, but I would not disagree with you um, what, what you said. Uh, but but uh, you know sometimes we're a little bit uh, limited to to how the system works and standard of care in in some of the journeys uh, is is predominantly needs to be exhausted before clinical trials might be might be shared. But we put a lot of effort in educating uh, around clinical trials. Um, and I think that, that that's still needed and that is the way to go. And um, these webinars are extremely helpful, but also uh, voices like yourselves to uh, to share that thought uh, outside of the companies that are, uh, yeah, in kind of the service provider side of things. I think uh, it's uh, it, it will take more to, to achieve this, but um, it would be great if uh, if clinical trials would be, you know, maybe say the standard uh, to, to, uh, tool in, in, the, in the toolbox, right, that uh, people are presented. Yeah, I think David, you you were next in uh, in line of questions. <laughs> uh, my comment on that is that uh, something I was not aware of, uh, but uh, when my oncologist recommended a clinical trial to me, the advantage was that uh, not that I was trying a new therapy, but that I was trying the next therapy in standard of care much sooner than I would have otherwise. Um, I'm enrolled in the charted two clinical trial, and I was chosen for the leg that combined both uh, um, uh, Zytiga and Cabazitaxel instead of waiting until I failed on Zytiga before trying the next uh, set of chemo. So um, it's not just uh, medications that are um, uh, options. There's also uh, options in timing. And uh, I got a really good result from that. And so I think that's a benefit people should know about. Yeah, no, excellent point. And I think uh, if if that is a tr one of the trials that are listed in in the reports that we provide, and we can provide some context to that, that, that always helps for for patients to consider uh, an option like uh, like you just described. So that's uh, yeah, very very. Uh, th thank you for making that comment. Um, I think Roger also had a question. Yeah, uh, do you uh, find trials outside the United States? And the reason I ask, I don't know if you noticed recently, the UK just launched a massive um, RNA vaccine trial. 
uh, that I didn't know anything about until after, you know, after it's too late and I read about it in the papers. Yeah, also a good question, and I'll, I'll start, and Madeline can, can chime in. I think uh, it's important to understand that, obviously, we, we try to assess the ability uh, uh, to travel, right? Um, we don't, uh, um, uh, we prefer not to immediately show uh, trials all over the world. Uh, th there are complexities, right? Insurance, uh, travel, burden on the site, and all kinds of other complexities, but uh, as we know, and the more information that's available, and you've discovered this also yourself, and uh, rightfully so, you want to uh, leave no stone unturned for, for uh, seeing what potential trials are out there. We do encounter these situations more and more, and we, we are able to do, to uh, to facilitate in cross-border uh, referrals. Uh, we're working with some partners to uh, address some of the, I would say, more technical complexities that uh, come uh, in, into play, uh, which which involve, uh, you know, uh, things like um, um, visas, uh, you know, work permits or uh, stay, uh, travel, uh, but more, also more importantly, um, uh, you know, the, the other kind of uh, consent and other kind of compl uh, complications that arise. So we, we're aware of those struggles for cross-border. Um, um, but, you know, a lot of coordination is necessary and, uh, it's something that, um, you know, maybe for a future, uh, webinar, we could demonstrate how a more seamless experience can be, uh, offered towards patients. But, uh, uh as we all know, you know, 80% of the trials are done in, uh, you know, the Western hemisphere of the, and, uh, there are many patients out there that, uh, obviously don't live in those countries and, um, uh, maybe it might make sense for for patients to arrive or to travel some countries. Maybe there are uh, kind of um, uh, main trial countries and sub uh, PI kind of models that will be established in the future. But uh, yeah, um, uh, if uh, persistent and in certain occasions, we might be able to provide trials uh, overviews uh, that are um, also some other countries. But again, it it, it does have. Um, extra complexities that we want to share up front that it's no guarantee that this could be an easy or successful journey. I don't know, Madeline, you've also had experience. Maybe you want to chime in on that. Yes. So I've performed um, several cross-border referrals. Um, it is very complex. Um, so as Dennis mentioned, during our treatment search reports, we often try and keep it nationwide. And then if there are no um, results that are interesting, we can expand our search, but that's only upon the request of the patient and the family themselves. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of barriers such as language requirements. Some um, countries require you to be able to read speak and write um, in that language and medical visas. So um, it definitely can be done. Um, it is a lengthier process and we are um, working alongside others to try and make this uh, more seamless and more accessible. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Madeline. And Roger, I hope that answered your, your question. Maybe just to go for the sake of time. So, um... Yeah, and we, we've 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 touched upon this uh, in certain parts, uh, Madeline. But how do you ensure that patients and their families are uh, well informed about their options and understand the process, right? Just uh, to avoid complexities. Yeah. So as Dennis <clears throat> mentioned in the beginning, um, each patient is assigned a dedicated pa patient navigator. So while we have a whole team, um, you will have one point of contact, um, and this is really to provide that personalized support and eliminating the need for patients to repeatedly explain their case. Um, that's why, as Clifford had um, mentioned, you know, in my response to him, each case is really tailored toward that patient. So even if I have two patients interested in the same trial, um, you know, their experiences will be different depending on their needs and their concerns. So we really take that time to truly understand each patient's needs, concerns. We answer general questions about clinical trials, and we really take the time to build upon that relationship. So following each intake call, patients should leave with a clear understanding of next steps, um, what to anticipate going forward. And at any point, a patient can reach out um, to me or the team via email or schedule an, another call. Um, perhaps they didn't ask questions that they wanted to during intake, or maybe they've now had a um, discussion with their physician and they want to loop them in. So Dennis had also mentioned that our reports are agnostic and are ordered in which um, the results are displayed are with the most advanced studies. So phase three um, first, then subsequently two and one. Um, and within those files, there are clickable links to share more information about each trial, such as description of the study, eligibility, and site locations. 
So for understanding that preliminary assessment, a post-TSR call can be done again with the patient navigator to further explain those options presented in that report. So it's important to note that these results um, are for clinical trials that they may be potentially eligible for and is based off of the information provided. So as I mentioned, some criteria aren't easily captured via the phone call. So perhaps the patient didn't have all the information needed to rule out or rule in, um, and this affects that accuracy of the report. So we can always go back once they've had um, other conversations with their HCP um, or new genetic um, tests done to then refine that search. Yeah, thanks, Madeline. And um, um, TSR, David, uh, um, oh. um, is a treatment search report. It's what we call our report with an overview of, of, of all the trials. Um, uh, yeah. Um, okay, and let's see, there's another question here. Might be outside of clinical trial as a topic, but patient can't access to, to cross-border travel. Is expand access become an option? Um, so the answer is yes. Um, um, uh, so we do th those options are also presented on these reports. Uh, historically, we've also we've always been very strong with uh, expanded access. Um, uh, I think I want to maybe come back to a little bit of the topic about okay, when is a trial your your first option? Uh, here also we have to follow a certain protocol according to uh, uh, regulations. Is that standard of care needs to be exhausted, then clinical trials, and then only expanded access. So those are listed at, as the, at, at the bottom. <laughs> At the last option, uh, again, we can uh, debate whether that uh, should be presented uh, in a different sequence, but unfortunately, that is how it is. But yes, these are also uh, explained. And um, um, yeah, uh, I think uh, you know, there is utility for expanded access pathways and maybe for some occasions where the trial is not running at their site, you know, that could also be an option. Again, I have to be careful not promoting it because... Uh, uh, you know, from the ethical point of view, uh, we need to advance scientific research, and um, uh, there are some pressures to always uh, push clinical trials forward uh, uh, more frequently than expanded access. Um, um, I hope that answers your question, uh, Nusantara. I hope. I hope so. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Looking um, um, uh, to, 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 we have 10 minutes left. Okay, so I think we have one more question. So yeah, we, again, we, we, we touched upon this, but maybe you could emphasize or explain a little bit more how the relationship works with the patients and referring physicians. And uh, coming maybe also back to the topic about community hospitals, those are referring physicians, maybe explain how that, uh, you know, how those relationships work and why it works well for them. Yes, so as I previously stated in my last answer, um, we do encourage patients to involve their treating physicians who understand their medical history best. Um, physicians can integrate into our process at various stages. Um, this may entail a one-on-one -on -one with a patient navigator, an invitation to our platform can be sent, or by simply sharing the treatment search report um, during their next doctor's appointment to review and aid in that decision-making process. Um, we can set up a three-way call. Um, it's really up to the patient as to how involved they want their physician to be. Um, it does make it um, better for all parties involved um, if they do loop them on earlier. But um, I say, I would say from experience, the best point is post-treatment search report call is the most beneficial time um, to include your treating physician as they can you know, assist with those considerations. Um, if logistics is an issue, such as travel, as Dennis mentioned earlier, um, we want to coordinate that as well to ensure that no unnecessary travel is put upon a patient. Um, and then in regard to community hospitals, um, yeah, if those physicians are at a local institute, um, they too can be invited to our platform and they can perform a treatment search report um, themselves for their patients. And then again, can loop us in um, in reverse, if that makes sense. Did I explain that well enough, Dennis? Yep. <laughs> okay. No. No, absolutely. And, and uh, there are also still questions coming in. So maybe I just wanted to quickly dive into that and then uh, maybe revisit this about referring physicians. But um, uh, the question was from David about expanded access. I was building a little bit on the previous discussion, but expanded access are for the uh, those patients that don't fit the, uh, the trial parameters. Um, if there is an expanded access, so the ability to provide the drug outside of the, a clinical trial, if that's made available by the company. So it's not off-label. It could be for other uh, uh, open to patients with a different indication than where the trial or the drug is being developed for. Um, uh, most companies um, uh, tend to do this a little bit later in their development stage towards uh, phase three. 
Uh, but some companies have a policy, uh, which is mentioned on the website, and that they would consider, um, they, they have the right to decline. So it's by no means a guarantee for getting access to the drug, but they will display their policy on their website, uh, in, uh, often uh, next to the clinical trials uh, uh, section within the website. Uh, it is an avenue for potential uh, access to the uh, to the uh, to the drug. Uh, I don't want to confuse it with um, uh, open label or even right to try. Though right to try is also somewhat uh, um, different. It's different re legislation, and it's it, and it's not all, uh, always only for N of one. Uh, there might be also group programs where a sponsor or an institution and, and a principal investigator is looking for kind of a group of similar patients, right? So. Um, um, but it is something to sometimes explore for, for companies. Again, um, uh, you, you do usually have to exhaust a few uh, clinical trials. Uh, so it is required to still search for trials or to make a, um, I would say, consideration for, uh, before you can even move into expanded access. Um, um, you know, um, so it, it depends, but it is um, something that we, we, um, we list. So I hope that answers your question, David. Yeah, okay. Um, I know this is the last question, so I'm also looking a little bit to Brad or if there are other que questions in the audience. Uh, I hope, let's say also this part with Madeline was able to explain the importance of being able to help both patients and referring physicians. Um, uh, I, I see it is that, you know, that referring physicians are becoming a more increasingly important uh, target audience for our platform uh, because we uh, know that the, obviously the academic centers run these trials themselves probably have patients at the institution, but what we're trying to find are the patient or help is the patients that are not necessarily at the institution or with a physician that is not doing trials every day. And they might have all sorts of questions or they still need to know about certain trials. And I think that's where our model provides a lot of value uh, to support the referring a physician. So we're looking also to a lot of ways how we can support uh, sites where they're referring physician uh, streams um, yeah, it is extremely important to focus on. We, we just had a webinar for uh, the Hispanic community uh, within neuromuscular to talk exactly about community hospitals and referring physicians and what kind of barriers they have. And uh, yeah, um, very happily also do one for, for cancer. But I think in general, there are, uh, you know, the clinical trial site map is not the same as where the populations reside. And the less travel and the less burden that we can um, uh, create for, for, for patients, uh, the better. Um, so it is, it is very important. Thanks, Sheriff, for the compliment. And then Brad, I'm looking to you. We still have four minutes left. Uh, do, you, are, do you have any questions or are there, are there still some questions out there in the audience? I, I have one question. Um, we, we uh, and I know you, you and I have talked about this before, but just for the record, um, how do you position yourself against others who offer similar services? Um, we had a session uh, with Massive Bio, which offers similar uh, clinical trial matching services. So just... How do you position yourself? And there, I'm sure there are others that provide similar services. Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, I think we, uh, uh, and I, I can't speak for others, but we want to uh, come across as um, um, you know a, 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 a partner that can work with patients and, and physicians. Uh, obviously, the pharma companies make a lot uh, of these things uh, available or, or possible, um, but serving all the stakeholders within the a kind of clinical trial ecosystem is what we really try to do. Um, I, I think many players are able to uh, to build lo lots of nice technology uh, within trial matching. We also have our, you know, our search engine is powered by AI. So are others, right? But I think kind of the the care and the the, the eye for detail for the patient journey is what we as a company strive to improve every day. And um, uh, we put a lot of emphasis in uh, making sure that uh, the people that deal with patients can do this as, 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 as you know, in the best possible way. Um, so it also comes down to the team. And, uh, you, you know, like, like you always know, in, in certain com competitive environments, you have the choice to work with many. Uh, but we really appreciate when patients have a positive experience with us. And hopefully that is something that we uh, come across as a... Uh, as, as doing well uh, and and learn from especially and um, you know those numbers that I presented are just uh, uh, one slide but uh, we hopefully to do that at, at scale uh, with many patients and uh, you know being a, a partner within this ecosystem. And you didn't touch on it, but wh where do you see this <clears throat> this area of clinical trial matching going uh, 
Of course, AI is uh, very much in a hype cycle at the moment. Uh, so presumably <clears throat> it could shoulder a lot of the burden of either matching or, you know, educating patients or giving them information. Where do you see the, this, the, in this area, what, where do you see the uh, navigation process going? Um, I, th I think it's I think in general it's a little bit of a, a hype uh, hype section actually in, in two weeks I'm going to present uh, also why our uh, our model is different than others but I, I feel that um, it's it's maturing and that we are starting to learn that I would say uh, just attracting patients or creating awareness is is only part of the problem right I think it's really being able to help a patient and speak with them compliantly and gather this information that we talk, talked about also to creating kind of the satisfaction all the way towards the site. So I would see much more mature business models uh, being able to do that. Uh, uh, and then, um, you know, like you also said, being able to get that huge patient pool that are unaware of trials or don't live near, near to trials, also having a great uh, experience in potentially considering a clinical trial, right? I think that's the, um, yeah, I think the, the, the horizon that everybody's aiming for. And um, yeah, I think within a couple of years, there'll be players, uh, hopefully ours as well, <laughs> that can do this. But uh, I'm, I'm very confident that, um, you know, with this AI's technology, um, I think the necessity and the pressures within the system are going to offer patients a much better, uh, yeah, uh, journey or experience than they, they've had thus far. Well, thank you. The timing is working very elegantly. You must have planned that. Um, <laughs> uh, Madeline, did you have any final words you wouldn't want to say? No, this was a pleasure. Um, I'm so happy that I got to speak with um, each and every one of you and that it really was an engaging um, conversation. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to thank everyone. Uh, excellent questions and uh, honored and, and grateful for this opportunity. So uh, thank you, Brad. And um, yeah, thank you all.